what was funny was uh, he he ends up down there. He gets down there. And my DP rushes over. He's like, oh, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Freeman, you don't have to get on the ground. Trust me, it's it's fine. And Morgan looked up at him and said, does the script say that I'm on the ground? I'm on the ground. It's great to meet you, Rusty, and to get to talk about 57 Seconds. It's quite the interesting little thriller. Uh, now, you are typically known for your work in a lot of horror anthologies, uh, especially the Tales from the Hood franchise. What about this project in particular, though, really sparked your interest to want to be a part of it? Well, I've always liked thrillers, and uh, I like sci-fi, so uh, it was a nice, um, you know, kind of a nice change to, in honestly, some of the aspects of directing horror and sci-fi are similar uh, anyway. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of dug the darkness of the story, the the idea of having something that take you back 57 seconds, what you could do with that amount of time, which is a lot when it really comes right down to it. And, you know, how small changes or changes, you know, done in 57 seconds, brief changes can make a dramatic difference for not just you, but those around you, the world in general, depending on how you use. I did like the the twist of having it only be 57 seconds versus anything bigger uh, for, for most of the movie. It was uh, a really fresh take on the time travel element. Um, now, with that said, though, uh, time travel movies can often come with a lot of major rules <laughs> that both the story and the filmmaker has to follow. And so I'm curious what that was like for you uh, and Macon Blair, who I saw is also a co-writer on this, uh, you know, laying down that groundwork and those ground rules for yourselves. The film was taken from uh, a short story called Lucifer by E.B. or E.C. Tubbs. I always get it. Or E.B., E.C., B or C. Your choice. <laughs> Tubbs. Um, anyhow, uh, he had created these rules within the short story. So he had created the you know, this this ring that got found went back 57 seconds, but then there was a latency period where you had to wait before you could kind of tap it again. Um, I think probably what we added to try and make that a little easier to visualize was the ring turning colors um, between when you could use it and when it was like kind of resetting itself, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, that wasn't in his his short story. But it was a way to kind of visually say, oh, the, you know, the, the ring is not usable during that period. Now, you know, did we in every single instance get that 57 seconds right on the nose when Franklin could use it? Eh, maybe not. But um, but the I but the concept is there and the, the idea of latency is there. So that was probably the most important thing, because what um, is also in the short story is the plane going down at the end, which we we used. And it was really important at that point, uh, now that we had introduced the villain to the to the story that wasn't actually in the short story, uh, but is now in the film. It's how Franklin kind of lets go and, you know, uh, mets out justice ultimately at his own expense at the end of the film. So it was really important to have that actually. And um, I'm sure I'm not the first person to say that actually having ground rules really actually in some ways opens up what you can do as opposed to being able to do everything. You, you Then nothing, nothing matters anymore, I guess. Having rules for time travel is just as much of fun to explore as it, as it can be uh, occasionally daunting to put together. So uh, yeah. I, I, I like the way that you went about it. Um now, in speaking of the villain, I, I did appreciate the timeliness of the story and, and dealing with big pharma and, and a lot of the negative effects that it's had on you know this country as a whole. Uh, what was you know, what did you have other ideas in mind for how to explore that theme or was it always that was the villain that you had in mind for this? No, we, we went around and about on it. I mean, um, you know, the short story is a exceedingly exceedingly um kind of personal and dark uh because it follows one guy who found the ring he's a bit of an asshole honestly and he there's really not, there's not any redeeming qualities to that guy um and so i think in a first pass of the script um 
and Ma- Macon's first pass on it, it, it was more centered in that way. Um, I think the character was did have some aspects of him that you like, but it was a pretty dark journey down a rabbit hole for this guy. And, you know, the 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 trick, and it, you know, by the way, really well written and amazing. But, you know, I'm trying to find something that would work in the marketplace, uh, which isn't as accepting of, you know, anti-heroes and dark stories as uh, some of us might like. Um, we tried to find a way to kind of open it up a bit and give Franklin, uh, Josh Hutcherson's character in the film, um, something that you could root for him because of something that he was doing and, uh, giving him a, a villain, something to work against seemed like an obvious thing. Now we, there was a draft that was practically all political and it was dealing with, a. a a race for a governor or something. I can't even remember what it was. That was kind of something that was there before I came on. And once I came on, I was kind of looking at that and I understood why they did that, but it became kind of a, a big, kind of a, a, a messy thing. It was kind of, it was hard to follow. Um, so or I was trying to just kind of streamline it find a villain that was easily understood and because of what was going on with the Sacklers and um, Oxy at that time, it seemed like a, you know, easy, an easy target. And uh, then giving Franklin something to fight for. So a sister has died because of this drug. And now you have something where it's like, Oh, well he could get this, this cool thing. Uh, he has the desire to use it for good, but the idea um, you know, that that absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely was a way to to play around with him, the ring, his his villain, who he's after. But then this kind of angel on the other side who, you know, is kind of the scales of justice kind of go like this. You kind of go, well, I think he's a good guy. Well, he seems like a really nice guy, but maybe he's not. Um, so it puts Franklin in the middle of that and kind of ups his moral his moral journey um and hopefully gives people a reason to you know kind of root for him while they watch him kind of on his descent into uh not madness but uh, bad decisions now josh is someone who i've appreciated his work ever since bridge to terabithia as a kid and i've just you know seen him grow and and do so many amazing things and he balances that very well but I'm curious how challenging it was for you to find the perfect lead actor to embody that, you know, moral tug of war, uh, like you were just discussing. It was a difficult discussion um, in the in the versions of the script prior to because they were they were much darker. This one, because we knew we were kind of walking that line between light and dark. He seemed I, I think he was like one of the first people that came to mind once we had that version of the story because he's such a good everyman you could see it's easy to imagine yourself as him you know some guys you look at they're they're, and i'm not saying that josh is not handsome but you know he's not he's not uh he's not that unattainable handsome (laughs) that you see he's like a decent looking guy with uh um kind of every man kind of values uh, in, in the in the way in a lot of the roles that he's he's had also by the way, so he seemed like a really good choice uh, from that standpoint, and you know, lucky for me he's also uh, that we got him that he's just a wonderful actor and and a great um, a great guy to have on set. He's he's really smart. Uh, he comes super prepared and he just gets the he gets the job done. Um, so, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough about uh, Josh. I love that you got to have that collaborative experience with him then. And I totally agree on his everyman uh, accessibility. I mean, even coming up in Five Nights at Freddy's, he feels like such a normal guy. Uh, and I mean, can't wait for that one. Um right. Now, you also, of course, have Morgan in this movie and, uh, you know, Morgan does a lot of indie productions like this, but he always brings that gravitas that he's known for to every role. 
Um, what was it like approaching him for this and, and you know, talking about this character with him? Morgan read, uh, I, I guess, the one of the drafts um, with the pharmaceutical kind of angle in it and really liked it. The trick uh, to getting him to ultimately say yes to the role was trying to find some sort of real science that connected to time travel. Um, he's a stickler for having real science and things. And I'm like, well, you know, it's time travel. It's, it's magic. I, I don't know. Like, who knows how this thing happens? But uh, he he was adamant about it. So, you know, we ended up having to talk to some physicists and some people in the scientific community. And we got, you know, current, we're like, well, what? And there are kernels. Um, would it happen the way it happens in the movie? Uh, I doubt it, probably. But um, we found enough to to ground it in real science to get Morgan uh, to say yes uh, to the role. And, and once he showed up, he was just in 100 percent. There's a scene where uh, he's someone tries to shoot at him. He ends up on the ground of a stage. And I can remember the majority of our crew, uh, you know, well, Morgan, you don't have to do that. We got a stunt guy. It's going to be fine. And this, that, and the other. And then uh, I didn't say that to him because I had talked to him and I, I knew that he, what he was about as an actor. But what was funny was uh, he, he ends up down there. He gets down there and my DP rushes over. He's like, oh, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Freeman, you don't have to get on the ground. Trust me, it's it's fine. And Morgan looked up at him and said, does the script say that I'm on the ground? I'm on the ground. <laughs> and, and so you really just have to love, you know, someone of his age and his, you know, prestige with the in the in the industry and what he brings being just that committed to, you know, our little movie. It was uh, it was wonderful to work with him. Now, did you feel his push for the realism and the extended or extended research um, into the science benefited the movie uh, as far as making it feel not just for his character, but for everybody, a more um, easier to explain kind of film? Yeah, I mean, what it did was it it created a, a, you know, I guess I would call it a logic, but an understanding for Burrell, who was um, his character, Morgan's character in the movie, Anton Burrell, um, because he has to explain you know what this thing does and so it kind of forced us to come up with what that was i mean we would have had something anyhow but we everything would have been made up from you know fairy dust um but this way you know you're at least grounding it in something that that is real and it and it, it actually helped in the kind of congealing the idea of how this of how this thing works now most people aren't going to know which part of that is real or not but it was helpful in terms of of writing the writing the explanation it was definitely helpful from from morgan because it gave him a, a sense of you know how this happened and in fact um, it helped me in terms of, you know, I, I told Morgan kind of at one point this was in the script, his backstory, and we kind of we kind of lost it. We didn't feel like we needed it to be actually said in the story. But, you know, his backstory was that he was a young guy whose father died when he was young and uh, he had been kind of chasing science since then. And he had found this thing because of the death of his father. He he wanted to be able to go back and meet his father. Now, 57 seconds, uh, the way it works, wouldn't get you there. But that's how he stumbles upon it. The interesting thing was after I gave him that, I was doing some research online. And there was a black uh, physicist, kind of astrophysicist, who father died and who is one of the few who is doing anything uh, in theory about time travel. So it was kind of like, oh, this, this guy exists. That's a cool parallel to figure out. Uh, but it, yeah. it, it, 
I mean, it, it makes the, the character all the more interesting. Uh, yeah. That's that's awesome. Um, before I let you go, uh, I did want to ask, I've been a big fan of, of Creep Show since it launched. And oh. uh, I've loved that you've gotten a couple episodes on it. I know season four is on its way. Um, but I don't believe they've announced the directors yet. Are you returning for season four? I haven't heard anything. I would love to. Um, I think things have shifted a little. I think they were shooting uh, when I shot in Atlanta. And I think I had a chance on the last season, but um, I was in Canada shooting. Ironically, they're now shooting, I believe, in Canada. I think they're in Vancouver. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Fingers crossed. I loved working with Greg Nicotero. I actually went to high school with Greg Nicotero, believe it or not. Um, or the same high school. I think he might have been a little in front of me. Uh, put my age down. Greg's up. There you go. And uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh working on creep show was an absolute blast because you know my first my first uh studio film tales from the hood had all practical effects in it w with the exception of you know i think the devil's tongue at the end which today looks so terrible <laughs> but um being able to work with Greg, you you know, his his whole thing is all this practical effects stuff. And so um it, it it's it was so much fun to kind of go back into that world and have to figure things out, you know, in camera or what you're going to do to manipulate the footage that you've actually shot as opposed to you know, talking to someone with a sketch pad and going, we could put it this here and then the hand come from there and all of that stuff. And and personally, I, I think practical effects and for some reason look creepier, you know, um, digital just uh, digital can look fantastical, but it, it rarely to me looks creepy. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I've been for Halloween, been rewatching plenty of the old classics and movies like American Werewolf in London still creep me out because of the prosthetics. So uh, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And yeah. so between Tales from the Hood and Creepshow, you've, you know, tackled many different kinds of horror stories. Is there anyone in particular that you would love to go back to or that you haven't explored yet? There is a stack of um, stories that I have. uh uh, my co-writer on Tales from the Hood, he has some too, that we had written for different different uh, iterations of, of Tales from the Hood. Some that we tried to get into the, the two that we shot after the first one, but uh, could not do because of budget concerns. Um, obviously, Tales deals with a lot of politics. There's things that they wouldn't let us do because of political concerns, believe it or not. Um, so yeah i mean there there are there's a there's a number of stories that i like that i'd like to do some of them now i'm just trying to to write as short stories and hopefully i'll i'll publish them as short stories or something and then i'm also talking to someone about uh potentially a graphic novel which would take some of these take some of these ideas and kind of play you know around with them like the old uh DC Comics stuff used to do. Well, I'm really intrigued to see what comes from that. I hope to see you back in Creep Show at some point, and uh, I look forward to spreading the word about this movie. It's really quite the unique little time travel thriller. So, Rusty, thank you so much for taking the time. I greatly appreciate it. Grant, thank you very much. Appreciate it.